Well, I knew it would happen eventually. My tabletop got sentenced to two weeks in the dungeon. My tabletop's been in my basement for the last two weeks to get acclimated to the humidity and temperature within inside my house. The only thing left to do is to do some inlays. Today we're going to take a shaper origin and we're going to do an inlay on that tabletop. After that we're going to pour some black epoxy in it and finish the tabletop off. So let's get started and head to the dungeon. So here we are in the dungeon with our furnace and water heaters. Over here is our fully acclimated table that we're going to be working on. So today we're going to be working with the Shaper Origin. This is a handheld CNC machine that's great for doing things like creating templates or doing inlays. Today we're going to be doing some inlays. So let me show you what the Shaper Origin is all about and then we'll create some of those inlays. So here's a close up of the Shaper Origin. This is an extremely easy to use tool and it just takes a little bit of practice to become very proficient in it. Let's take a closer look at some of the features of this tool. So the most predominant thing about this router is the display at the top. This gives you a roadmap for when you're creating your cuts so you know exactly where you are in your design. This display is also connected to a camera that's on the back that uses domino yeah. tape to make sure that you know exactly where you are in the cut. I'll show you what the domino tape looks like in just a moment. So if we go back to the front of the router, you can see that the router is actually a separate device from the base of the router. The router is plugged in on the side of the base and can be easily removed. If we look at the router by itself, it's extremely easy to change out the router bits. This router has got a locking mechanism at the front that locks down the collet, and then you can take your wrench to simply replace the bits and tighten them down. When replacing the router into the base, it's simple to do. You simply make sure that the on and off switch is facing front, and you slide it into place. Then you lock it down with a hex key, and you plug it into the side. If we look at the side of the router, you can see that there's a speed adjustment going from 1 to 6. I tend to leave mine at 6 at all times because when we're using this router, we're using very small bits. When we look at the front of the router again, you can see that each handle of the router has got a button on it. On the right hand side there's a green button, and on the left hand side there's an orange button. The green button engages your router and lowers it to your workpiece. The orange button retracts the router and lifts it off your workpiece. The last thing to know about the physical components of this router is there's a magnetic dust shield. This easily locks into place with some magnets and there's a dust port on the side. I always recommend using a Festool dust collection with this router. So now that we have a basic understanding of the physical components of this router, it's time to look at the software that's used with this router. Let's do that right now. So this is a software package that I prefer to use. It's called Inkscape and it's completely free. All you need to do with Inkscape is to upload your image and convert it to a SVG file. Once you've converted it to an SVG file, you can go to shaperhub.com and upload that image. So here we are at shaperhub.com. Here I'm signing into my account and logging in. Once you're logged in, all you need to do is to click on the little icon in the top right hand corner and hit My Files. This will then take you to all your files on Shaper Hub. Click on the little blue plus button on the bottom right hand corner and this will take you to a file explorer where you can upload your image. Once your image is uploaded, it's automatically downloaded and put onto your Shaper. So one of the first things that I always like to do when starting a cut is to mark the center line of where I want my design to be. So I'm going to take my straight edge and I'm going to mark on the wood. I'm going to do a crosshair for this. Once I have that in place, I can then move on to downloading the image. The next thing that I always like to do before I make any of my cuts is to center my router base approximately where the cuts are going to be made. This gives me an idea of where I'm going to place out my shaper tape. Now that I have an idea of where the router needs to be placed, it's simply a matter of placing down the shaper tape. Now when placing my shaper tape, I always like to leave about 4 inches between each line of the shaper tape. You can never have too much shaper tape, so that's something to remember. So the first thing that we want to do is to make sure that we're attached to the internet. By simply clicking the gear icon, you can see here that I'm already connected to the Flindog network. Now that we're connected to the network, it's simply a matter of creating a scan. Creating a new scan is very easy to do. You can see in the upper left hand corner there's an item that says New Scan. Simply press that with your finger, and by pressing the green button on the right hand side of the router, you can start your new scan. So to create a new scan, your Shaper Origin is going to use the camera that's on front to register all the dominoes that you just placed down. When a domino is registered, it's going to turn blue. 
Once I have all the dominoes in a blue shade, I'll know that I have a complete scan. So here you can see that the Shaper Origin has registered the scan. Now one thing to note is that this image on the screen is not a live image. If I place my hand in front of the Shaper Origin, you won't see my hand. This is simply an image of what you just scanned. The next thing that we want to do is to create a grid on our scan. This is something that I think is absolutely critical for any inlays or any precision work that you need to do. Let me show you exactly how to do that. So if we look at our scan, you can see that there's an option here to create a grid. If we press that, we can hit the green button to start a new grid. Now we need to lower the bit until it can make sufficient contact with the edge. So let's do that right now. So for this process, it really doesn't matter what router bit you have in the router. You just need to make sure that you have a router bit in there. So we need to pull our actual router off the edge of the actual workpiece and lower the bit until it goes lower than the actual workpiece. If we look beneath the router, you can see that the actual router bit is lowered below the workpiece and resting against the edge. That's what we're looking for. Once that's complete, we can simply set the depth and align it so that that line is perfectly aligned with your workpiece. Once that's done, you hit the green button to do your probe one. It's probing time. Now it's time to take the actual router and move it to the next point. To do the second probe, we're simply gonna move the router right or left of the first probe and get it so it's touching the edge of the surface of your workpiece. Then we're gonna hit the green button to set the second probe. Now that we have the first two probes in line, we're gonna set up the third probe. The third probe will be perpendicular to your first two probes and you can set it by pressing the green button. Now that we have all three of those probes set, there's a very light grid pattern that runs across your entire workspace. Now it's time to use that grid to actually place our image. To import the image, we're simply gonna hit the import button. This is going to go to the web and go to Shaper Hub. And you can see here, we have our logo in place. So I'm going to select that image and it's gonna download from the internet. Now you can see it's placed that image using the grid pattern in a particular spot. And now we can align that image so that it's exactly where we want it. So the nice thing about the Shaper Origin is you can zoom in and zoom out simply by pinching your fingers. This is very similar to an iPhone. So off camera, I've done a couple of things. I've placed an engraving bit into the router and I've placed and sized my actual image exactly where I want it to be on this tabletop. There's just a couple more things we need to do before we can start to make those cuts. Let's move on. So the last thing that we have to do before making any cut is to do Z-Touch. If you look over here on the left, there's a button called Z-Touch. If we press that button, you can hit the blue button that says Z-Touch, and this is gonna lower the bit until it touches the surface of your workpiece, just to get an idea of where the router bit is in relation to your cuts. Now that we have that done, it's time to start looking at how we're gonna make those cuts. So now that we have the Z-Touch done, now we need to let the router know that we're gonna be doing some engraving. So the first thing I wanna do is to set the depth. And if I click the depth icon, I can hit engrave. The next thing I wanna do is to let it know what router bit we have. So if I click the router bit icon, I can hit engrave. Now that that's done, we can start to make some of the cuts. One thing that's critical when using this router is to have a good dust collection set up. If you don't, there's a very good chance that this thing is gonna get clogged up and your cuts won't be as nice. So if we take a closer look at what I'll be saying when I make my cuts, you can see that these circular lines going around the O, these are what give you guidance as to how to make the cuts and which direction you need to go. So that's what I'll be following as I make these cuts. In this video here, you can really see how the router moves independently of the router base. This eliminates any human error made while you're moving your router across the workpiece. If there is an error made, the router bit will automatically retract. This next piece of video shows how you only need to keep your router bit inside the circle. The router bit will automatically make the cuts as you keep the circle in line with where the router bit needs to go. However, if you get the router bit outside of that circle, once again the router bit will retract protecting your workpiece. So one thing I did want to mention is I double pressed the green button when I was making these cuts. This creates an auto cut function. This allows you to simply just follow the router bit as it moves across your workpiece and not have to concentrate much on making sure that your router bit's exactly where it needs to be. So here's a closer look at our cuts. 
Now all we need to do is to put some black epoxy in here so that everything shows up exactly how we want. Let's do that and mix up some epoxy right now. Now before we move into the epoxy pour, I ask you to do me a favor. Please subscribe to this channel as it really helps out this small channel. Also leave a like and leave a comment as I really enjoy reading those. I'm also going to be leaving descriptions to everything we're going to use here in the description. So for today's pour, I'm going to be using liquid glass epoxy and this is a one to one ratio. Now we're not going to need very much because it's a very small indention in the wood that we're going to try to fill. I'm also going to be using black diamond mica powder. Now for today's pour, I'm going to be using battleship gray. So let's pour this up, mix it up and then start the pour. Since this is such a small pour, I'm going to be using plastic cups to do my measurements. Now I've already poured part B into this container right here. So I'm going to pour part A into this container. Now that I have that poured, I can already tell that I have too much epoxy poured, but that'll be okay. The next thing I'm going to do is to mix the two parts A and B together. And for this, I want to make sure that I'm stirring this for about five minutes. I want to make sure that everything is good and incorporated. Now one thing to note when using mica powder, sometimes it's a good idea to let the epoxy sit for a bit. This allows it to thicken Ew. up a bit and then the mica powder doesn't all fall to the bottom. So now that I've stirred it up for a considerable amount of time, I'm just going to add some mica powder. Now that I've mixed up that mica powder into the epoxy, it's time to make the pour. Lastly, I'm going to take my torch and encourage some of these bubbles to come up to the top and break. So now it's just a waiting game. Now that I've poured the epoxy, I'm going to let it set for a couple of days. Once that's done, I'm going to sand it down to the wood and it should look really nice. Well, thanks for joining me today in my dungeon. I really enjoyed showing you some of the basic features of the Shaper Origin. This thing is great for doing things like epoxy inlays. I hope you learned a little bit and until next time, take care as always. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I know I had a lot of fun showing you all the features of the Shaper Hub. If you get a chance, make sure you subscribe and leave a like. Also hit that notification bell so you can be informed when future videos come out. Also leave a comment. I love reading your comments and it gives me ideas for future videos. Until next time, take care as always.